today on City Line. Real talk about what happens after childbirth. The biggest question they always ask women, how do you balance mm. it all? And I really had to sit there and go, I'm not. It's the City Line Real Life After Baby special. Ended up having some really dark thoughts and thinking, maybe this baby will just be better off without me because I'm going to screw this baby up. Then breaking taboos on your post-baby body. We always hear bounce back. But there's no back that we're bouncing to. We have made babies. <laughs> yeah. And we are our new selves. And later, you're like Ariel, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Chauvina shares her tried and tested products that can ease the pain of postpartum. Ooh, it's a nice look. Right? <laughs> I like it. It keeps all your guts together. It's City Long with Tracy Moore. Wednesday. So today's show is all about life after baby and what you need to know, and there is a lot. We're going to start by challenging the bounce back myth and diving deep into the genuine postpartum experiences of moms. This is a time for an honest conversation about the real journey of motherhood, the stuff that doesn't really get talked about. So please welcome Sarah, Nicole Landry, and B. Kwame. Out. Because I don't get to see you both in real life. Have a seat. Thank you for joining us. You know, the moments after welcoming a baby are supposed to be filled with joy, celebration, and lots of newborn cuddles. Like, remember all the commercials? Oh. And it's like, <laughs> and it's two parents, and there's a baby between you, and you all woke up after a beautiful nine hours of sleep. Yeah. <laughs> and it's clean, and yeah. it's quiet. It's clean, it's quiet, it's beautiful. It's like there's an angelic light. That's not the case for all mothers. Even celebs are speaking out. Chrissy Teigen re revealed that she didn't realize that she had postpartum depression until her daughter, Luna, was three months old. Cardi B told Harper's Bazaar, I thought I'd avoid postpartum. The doctor warned me, but I felt fine. Then suddenly, everything felt heavy. Alanis Morissette told CBS, I asked my doctor, does this go away if I just white knuckle through it? She said, no. It actually gets worse. So I went on medication right away. Now, what's good about this is that more women are opening up. Post-baby life can be a tough, tough journey. Sarah, you recently shared that you were starting to feel your, yourself again three years after having Lemmy. Yes. Talk to us a bit about that. That's Some people might look at that and say three years. Isn't I know. it six weeks? I know. And I don't want it to be daunting. I want it to be beautiful because yeah. I think that... I came into having my fourth child. I hadn't given birth in over a decade. And coming into the experience, my life was very different. I was much more established. My kids were older. And now I'm going to have teenagers and, like, tweens and teenagers and a baby. Yeah. It was a lot all at once. And I felt like I was holding on to multiple dreams. And I was trying hard to balance it all. That's the biggest question they always ask women. How do you balance mm. it all? And I really had to sit there and go, I'm not. I'm not balancing. Actually, there's a lot of drop balls, and I'm just really hoping they're not the glass ones. Yeah. And so I really started talking a lot more online about the realm of grief and the fact that for me, I really had to let go of the version I was before I had not just the first baby that I had at 21, but this new baby I had at 36 and how I really had to let go of her time and time again. And, I, and that with each time... I processed a little bit more change. I felt like myself again, not because I was returning to somebody I was, but because I was meeting myself where I was at and I was able mm. to start embracing her through her change, through her life circumstance, all of it. And I'm really glad that I let myself go right through all the feelings and, and advocating for yourself, going to the doctors, getting yourself checked, all those things that they poke and prod at you the whole pregnancy. You give birth six weeks later, nobody's going to come and check on you again. You've got to do it for yourself. And you're hearing a lot from moms. Like, mm -hmm. did you get, are you getting big reaction from moms when you talked about this whole idea of meeting yourself where you're at? Yeah, I mean, I was a little afraid when I put that out there because I thought, does anybody else have this feeling where it didn't happen for them six months in and yeah. maybe it's happening three years down the road where they're finally like... <sighs> okay, look at this is we're, we're doing it. Not only did we do it, but we're doing it. And it maybe wasn't the movie vision that we had. Um, I think that one video I did was shared over 12,000 times. Wow. And that really 
that really woke me up to being, okay, there's a lot of us, and some people were saying, you know what, I'm eight years, and I'm really just starting to feel it. I'm really starting to feel like myself again. Again, not a version of before, but the version I am now. The thing that was so surprising for me about motherhood is this idea, I didn't know I was gonna have to fight so hard for myself. Mm -hmm. So I have to, like, who am I? Who am I? How do I find her? How do I have the space a little bit to find who I am? B, you suffered with depression, as did I, after giving birth. What was that journey experience like? Yeah, with my first daughter, I had read a lot about postpartum depression during my pregnancy to kind of prepare, yeah. just in case, right? Mm -hmm. And what essentially happened was I did have postpartum depression. It just didn't look like anything I had read. So then I just assumed it wasn't. Everything I read was all about, you know, mothers who just don't feel an attachment to the baby, can't stand to hear the baby cry, those types of things. Mine manifested more in the realm of thinking I was not good enough for this baby. Mm -hmm. I was so highly self-critical that I ended up having some really dark thoughts and thinking, maybe this baby will just be better off without me because I'm going to screw this baby up. And it took really kind of interventions from family members to really come in and say something is going on. You need to talk to somebody and get some help because this is not how you should be feeling. So I learned postpartum depression can look very different. Were you um, surprised? Mm -hmm. Like, I remember being shocked at myself. Yeah. Because you have to get over beating up yourself for being sad. Yes. I wanted this pregnancy. It was a great pregnancy. I had the baby. I have this family that I wanted, and now I'm sad. Mm -hmm. What is wrong with me? Yeah. Do, so were you surprised by it? And also, I would love to know... Um, the family member, like how they did that intervention and sure. did you believe them? Right, right. So to answer your first question, uh, I was very surprised mm -hmm. and there was a lot of surprises that came in. Another surprise was learning that my mom had postpartum depression with me, which we had never talked about until I started opening up. Uh, and then just adding to that critical voice of, oh, you wanted this, so you shouldn't feel this way. You shouldn't be struggling and having to really kind of fight that, that inner voice. But it was actually between my mother and my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law who descended upon the house one day and said, we need you to sit down, we need to have a conversation, and we need to find out where you go from here. Mm -hmm. So I just felt like finally somebody saw me because I was scared to be the one to say how much I was struggling. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to throw in there with my experience. What's what's shocking is I'm so close to my parents, but I could mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't tell them. It was my husband who realized I had stopped eating, yeah. and like I never stop eating. That was a <laughs> that was a red flag right there. And I remember him cutting up my food into tiny little pieces and trying to like I, I'm still raw about it, and I have a 15 year old. Mm -hmm cutting up my food into tiny little pieces and feeding me. And so he talked to a girlfriend of mine and he said, she's struggling, I don't know what to do. And it was that girlfriend that called me tomorrow and she's like, what's going on, Trey? And I'm like, I'm sad, I'm crying inside the house, I'm crying outside the house, I'm crying at the gym, I'm crying in the shower. There's no end to the tears. And I said, it's, it's harder than I thought it was gonna be. And she said, it is hard. We don't talk about how hard it is. It's hard, right? Very, yeah. um, but you almost need that person. Oh, I'm, I'm okay for the tissues, honey. I, I got it back together. <laughs> I see them running around with a box of, a box of <laughs> tissues back there. I got it together. I'm pulling it in. Um, but I think that we, at the risk of, I don't always want to talk to moms about how difficult it is because I'm afraid that I'm going to be that, that doomsday person mm -hmm. that's telling them all the bad stuff at the same time. I'm like, if you are feeling off at all, if there's anything that you feel you're not feeling like yourself, I'm here. Talk to me. We can talk about any of the things. 100%. So I want to talk a little bit about this idea of prioritizing our minds rather than our mirrors. And that came mm -hmm. from you, B. Like, mm -hmm. what do we need to do to start switching um, the conversation from the bounce back yeah. to our mental health. Exactly. You know, and I think, Sarah, you kind of spoke to this initially as well about meeting yourself where you're at. Mm -hmm. I find that the conversation around snap back and the bounce back 
We relate it to our bodies because when you step into motherhood, you're stepping into, you're grieving who you've lost, you're meeting this new version of yourself, and for a lot of us, we're still trying to find some way to control and be the person that we've always known ourselves to be. Mm -hmm. So an easy way to do that is like, I can still get back into the jeans I wore before, I can still get back into the dress I wore before. So I think we really have to start to think about, even when we're talking about the bounce back and the snap back, what's happening mentally? And how do we need to have those conversations, right? So it's really just releasing that and thinking about who are you and what is the emotional side of this and the, what is the mental side that's coming into play. We have so much more to discuss. Thank you both for sharing your journey with us. We're going to take a quick break, but lots more City Lines to go ahead. Stay with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Coming up, the true effect of childbirth on our bodies. I asked the nurse, I'm like, can I, can I have a wheelchair? And she looked up at me and she was just like, why? She's like, women walk out of here with two questions all the time. Welcome back, everyone. The body changes that happen during the postpartum period sometimes feel too taboo to talk about, but I got some moms here with me today to discuss the experiences that often get overlooked. Sarah is back for this chat along with Shobana Lakavali, Amanda Muse, and Sarah Jaman Yassin. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Shobana, let's get into it. You had great pregnancies, but how did that compare to your deliveries and recovery? Wow, uh, my recovery was very uh, painful and very debilitating. Uh, you know, I thought I had all my bases covered. I tried to prepare for postpartum depression. I had the pelvic floor massages, you know, mm. in hoping that I would prevent tearing. But I didn't think about what would happen if I did tear and how that recovery was. And no one talks about it. We have all these C-sections, all these, you know, vaginal births, and no one talks about the trauma that happens to our, our body. Mm -hmm. And so to put into perspective, my first child I had, you know, after a long labor, epidural, vacuum, birth, mm -hmm. right? I tore. Mm -hmm. Second child, two hours in the car, no epidural. It can happen yes. to anybody. And I experienced a second to third degree tear in the muscle, right? And so. To give you a little bit of context here, yep. second degree tear is uh, tearing of the muscle, which is the perineum between your vagina and then your back end, right? Mm -hmm. Third degree tear, you're cutting through your anus. Mm -hmm. Fourth degree tear, you're cutting all the way from the front to the back. And imagine eating, sitting, Everybody's laughing. Everybody's right now, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. If you still feel Imagine it. going through it. It sounds horrific. Exactly. Yeah. And I only had a second, I only had a second to third degree tear. Yeah. But I couldn't walk for months. I was on Advil and Tylenol in rotation. Mm. Um, I had hemorrhoids and I was so terrified of just splitting open when I went to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So stool softeners, my best friend, I was like, give me those stool softeners. Like yes. I didn't know who used them before. And then I was like, now I know, <laughs> now I know. Yeah. And you know, it can be an isolating process. Like. My husband, Mike, and I, we had a conversation. I'm like, I'm going to take care of the baby, feeding mm -hmm. the baby. You do everything else. He's like, cool, I'm on that. And still it was isolating because as I left the hospital and I wasn't able to walk, right, I had sutures sticking into my tear, mm -hmm. I asked the nurse, I'm like, can I, can I have a wheelchair? Mm -hmm. And she looked up at me and she was just like, why? She's like, women walk out of here with C-sections all the time. Mm. And it was so um, diminishing to me. Mm -hmm. And it just shows how we as a society kind of treat labor, pregnancy, and women. We just lump them all together, and if one can do it, the other should too, and if you can't, then you're shamed for it, right? Yes. So that's why these kind of conversations are so important. Absolutely, because that is a lot. Yes. So not only are you going through the hormonal fluctuations, you're going through major pain, Yes. and maybe feeling like you are not able to contribute what your baby, what you wanted to. Exactly. You can't exactly. even get up, you're afraid to go pee, right? Yes. Okay, a lot of women hope for a vaginal delivery. It's this whole thing, and I was one of them, and I don't know why I was so obsessed. Uh, but Amanda, you ended up needing a C-section. Uh, that was your experience. It, it was not what you wanted. No, no, you know, you're right. It, it's kind of like everybody wants the regular birth, right? Mm. We don't want to think about the other options, although I feel like with a little bit of time, we're realizing motherhood comes to many people in many different ways, right? Yes. So I had my babies, actually, I was living in Malaysia, and so I was pregnant with my first, and I was like, we are going to have a water birth. I sought out the top, the only uh, water birth guy in Malaysia, and I didn't even want to talk about a C-section, but when it came down to it, 
my baby was sunny side up. She was not coming out, and so we needed to go for a C-section. What was so hard was that disconnect of like this was the plan and it went completely a different direction and that feeling of being out of control and I recognized in that moment like I was disconnecting from my experience and as much as I was connecting to the baby the healing for me was not coming so quickly mm -hmm. and I remember with my second um, I, we knew okay if we VBAC wasn't an option I just make those babies really big and I remember <laughs> my daughter I said to him like how big is the scar gonna be you know and I'm gonna have another one and he goes no no and he said it's just gonna be the, the, the you know the size of my hand and I was like all oh, right because you're just going in taking this cute little baby out and yeah. it was a healing experience the second one but um, it really prompted me actually to start my YouTube channel because this is where I realized yeah. 12 years ago people were not talking about c-sections online it was like the one lady with seven kids and birthing them in the house and I was like I didn't have that experience so it really helped me kind of find my way back but it is a journey it is a journey and V back for those who don't know vaginal birth after c-section so often if you've had one c-section they tell you to just go ahead and have another yep. it might be I don't know is it is it easier to do it that way you're like I don't know, I don't know. But that's the second did. one was great we had music playing we had oh my laugh. gosh I'm with you with the second one too because I got drugs <laughs> <laughs> oh I don't know why I was like super mom for the first one like oh no I'm pushing them out all by myself and then and then I, I was like why didn't I do that <laughs> why okay Sarah you also had c-sections for both uh, your kids and thought everything was good but tell us about your recovery so I wasn't planning a C-section, just like Amanda. Mm -hmm. I had, I was gonna have it natural, that was the plan, I got big hips, we're gonna go for it. So I didn't really look up on C-sections, what was the aftercare, et cetera. And then I had a lot of pain after about eight months. So I went to go see my osteopath, and she told me, which I didn't really think about, your organs move to accommodate that baby growing inside of you. Mm -hmm. And then when you have a C-section, it has to move a little bit more to pull that baby out. So it's supposed to settle on its own, but it doesn't always settle 100%. Mm -hmm. So she did very gentle like adjustments just to put the organs back in place. And that to me, it really helped in my back pain. But another thing that I really didn't know is about C-section scar tissue. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't think about it after birth. I wasn't thinking I was gonna have a C-section. And after the baby came out, I was like a hamster on a wheel. I was counting poos, I was counting right. time between feeds, yes. right? And it was just all about the baby, the two week checkup, the four week checkup, and it was all about the baby's health. But I never thought about my health and what was happening, the scar tissue was there, until actually my second one, when I had to have another C-section. I was following YouTubers, influencers, and they were talking about scar tissue. And I thought, how come I didn't know about this three years ago when I had my first one? Mm -hmm. It's not really something that's promoted, as a mom, a new mom, take care of yourself. This is what has to happen. These are your follow-ups. You get one follow-up after six weeks and that's it. So all that scar tissue massage, I didn't have it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. See, I didn't, I still didn't know that. So that's good to know. So Sarah, you have four kids? I do. You have four kids. You Shocks have... me every day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a mom of four. Look yeah, at that. Yeah, I don't even like saying the sentence. It freaks me right now. <laughs> Does it really? Feel, yeah, because in my head, I'm like, I don't know. I should be going to university. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't feel right or real. It feels make-believe. You're yeah. like, I'm still a kid. Where yeah. did all these kids come yeah, from? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. These are mine, my responsibility. Right? <laughs> my husband and I say it to each other all the time. Yeah. Like, after we're done, like, disciplining them or something, and then they leave the kitchen, we're like, what are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> are we the adults? We don't know what we're doing. Are like, we we're the, the yeah. Yeah. So you had a big gap, like a 10-year yeah. gap between births. How yeah. did that affect your body and recovery? Yeah, so uh, a couple different things. Very similarly, I had a very, uh, I had episiotomy my first birth at 21. I had three kids by the time I was 25, two failed epidurals, all in hospital. Oh. And I find myself pregnant in a pandemic and struggling with uh, the fear around birth. I actually had prenatal depression and found out in therapy that I actually was carrying a lot of the things that happened in my birth and recovery into this new situation, even at, you know, 35, 36. So what I uh, really ended up doing was four different birth plans. And I'm not a crunchy granola kind of person. I never was like, I will go do the water birth thing. But there was so much more information now. There was so much more support online. And I allowed that to be one of my options. And I ended up having a much more educated birth. I had a really great birth at home with my entire family present, with my husband present, which was a big reason during pandemic, you're worried about separation yes. from partner. So ultimately, um, I ended up having a better recovery. Again, like people like Amanda who 
chose to share online and be, be really vulnerable with their experiences allowed me to come in a lot more educated and I ended up having a way better recovery. I love that. So you like, I guess you learn along the way, but also the information catches up with you. Yeah. I'm like, oh, if I could do it all again now, all the yeah. goodies, the products, which we're going to get into a, a little bit later on the show, but there's so much now for parents. So this conversation is just getting started. We're going to take a quick break, but stay with us. It's City Line Real, Life After Baby. City Lines Wellness Wednesdays is brought to you in partnership with Jameson Vitamins. For everyday immune support, Jameson is here for your health. Welcome back, everyone. Before the break, uh, we've been chatting about what happens to our bodies after birth, and of course, we've got more to share. We're going to talk about breastfeeding now. So I had a lot of difficulty with this. It's very much sold as this is the natural way to feed your your baby, and of course this whole slogan, breast is best, really <laughs> puts moms on the spot. Um, I had an underweight baby, and so there was a lot of pressure uh, to keep Sid, like to get him up to the right percentile in growth. Um, and when you're not, when, you, when not enough milk is coming out of your breast, and you've been told that that is the best way to nourish your baby, it, it's a bit of a, you know, it really plays on you because this is, you feel like this is your role as a mom. So I had to go to the lactation consultant. They did their thing. So we ended up having to supplement with formula, which felt so bad because society tells you it's so bad. So it was tough. And I really had to learn to let myself off the hook. Like it was, it was a tough thing to go through. How was breastfeeding for you? You know, you hit so many of the same notes that I went through. Yeah. Um, I really didn't want formula to the point that at a week, um, my baby was also underweight. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I still struggle with the fact that I failed her. And it's because I should have given her formula. I wasn't able to produce enough. And I, and I didn't, right? And we yeah. have that pressure as moms. Um, and I was lucky, though, Trace, because before having her, I had friends that sat down with me and they sat, they told me about their breastfeeding challenges. And I think moms a lot of the time are scared to share. Mm -hmm. They don't want to scare you, right? Yeah. Um, and they told me it's hard. And I was so happy and appreciative because they literally freed me of the expectations that I had of myself to breastfeed magically, like it's yes. all natural. They freed me from that feeling of failure, you know? Yeah. Um, but inevitably, I still had less milk. My baby had trouble latching, mm. so I struggled with lactation clinics. Um, and I just had bloody nipples that mm. were raw. Uh, and p putting a baby back on bloody nipples four or five times a day mm. is, is very, very painful, right? Yes. Uh, and so luckily, I had the support, and I was able to work through it over the last few months and make it work and make it that experience you're looking for. You sh people say you should look for. Right. Those bleeding nipples, man. Oh Every gosh. time the baby was hungry and Leo would be like, he's hungry, I'd be like, oh my gosh, someone <laughs> give this baby a steak and potatoes because I can't right now. There's also the pressure this six-week mark is supposed to be, well, you're back now, six weeks. Six weeks is the time in the United States when they have to go back to work. Mm -hmm. So for some reason, it's become the standard for you're back to yourself now. It's been six weeks. It's the time when you're supposed to be able to have sex again. So Amanda, talk to us a little bit about the post-baby sex. How did you feel about it in the six-week right. mark? So I felt that pressure. I was like, well, we hit that number. And I was like, we're, we're going to do this. Meanwhile, my husband was over here like, lady, like, <laughs> we just had a C-section. I saw all of the inside on the outside. I'm still coping. <laughs> and he's a little older than me. And he was like, I got a new baby. I got a job. <laughs> like, he was going through all the things. And I felt this pressure. So he had to kind of remind me, like, I'm going to be here in eight, in 12 weeks. Like, whenever <laughs> right. you're ready, you know, we'll, we'll be ready together. But I really had to kind of take that and go, what, what am I actually looking for? Oh, I'm looking for that intimacy with my partner that I'm not just a mom, like leaking milk and all of these things and, and find ways to connect to like that other side of my, myself. Yes. Um, and it was a tricky time and we figured it out. There is another baby, but, <laughs> but, um, but it was, it was a journey. And even now yeah. my younger sister just had a baby and I'm like, Take your time. Like, yes. we just pushed some babies out. We're going to deal with the other things later. So These uh, date and time uh, milestones are completely arbitrary. Yes. Throw them out and do what works for you. Like, just get yeah. rid of them. Yeah. Speaking of throwing things out, I want to talk about the snap back and the bounce back. Sarah J., you've got some thoughts on that. I really hate the term bounce back. Yeah. Because I was always, you know, we always hear bounce back. But there's no back that we're bouncing to. We have made babies. <laughs> yeah. And we are our new selves. So we have really have to normalize 
going into our new bodies, our new future. Our lives are not the same. Mm -hmm. So why do we expect to bounce back to something that is not there anymore? The person that we were is not the person that we are. We have to love ourselves and we have to love our children. And really, we just need to normalize our new selves. Absolutely. Uh, other Sarah, you have spent a lot of time on your page, on your Instagram, talking about this idea of bounce back. Talk to me about some of the thoughts that you went through uh, when you were going through your postpartum moment. Yeah, so after my first three, I started sharing about some coming to terms with a lot of postpartum for myself eight years after the fact and it was like I'd never seen stretch marks before and I wanted to talk about some of the differences and changes and I needed to be able to process all of this even eight years later and then going into this one I thought you know what I've got it and uh, I'm I'm in this arena I know it and I was so humbled I felt like I was really brought back to just the difficulties and the realities of how it felt and when I was pregnant I wrote this the ask is stretch, grow, birth, bleed, nurse, lose sleep, and make it look like nothing happened at all. And I was speaking from fear. I was speaking from the realities of what I know was coming, which is the, ba the bounce back culture. But then I gave birth and I repeated those words. The ask is stretch, grow, birth, bleed, nurse, lose sleep, and make it look like nothing happened at all. But no, let them see it. Let them know every single bit of it, because this is the beauty of the afterglow. Mm, yes. Those words. I love that. More coming up after the break, everyone. Stay with us. We got lots more coming up. I love that. Coming up, postpartum products to help you recover. Put this on underneath your bra. Exactly. If you're and even wearing a bra, like, <laughs> exactly. Don't feel like you gotta. prioritize our postpartum healing. This whole hour of City Line is all about helping you out with that. So here with a roundup of essential products to help you recover, Shobhan Alakavali joins me again. You got some good stuff. You got some good stuff. We're seeing more options for new moms, are we not? Finally, there's a shift happening yes. and we know that we need to start caring for our moms, right? Mm -hmm. And so I have some really great options. You know, when you, when you start having a baby, think about a baby, you become familiar with the name Frida. Okay, okay, and Frida's Frida. like your best friend because right. they create so many different options yeah. for C-section recovery as well, well as vaginal recovery, yeah. uh, which are incredible and innovative and no one else really does it like them on the market. Why don't I know Frida? Why isn't she my best friend? <laughs> I know. She, she obviously wasn't around in 2008. Exactly, exactly. Right, 2010. Exactly. Okay. And so, for example, here we have the C-section kit and I'm going to highlight a few products oh. that I think are really, really interesting. First of all, you get disposable uh, mesh stretchy postpartum underwear. It'll look good to me. Yep. And it's high enough so it'll cover the incision. Yes. So it won't be cutting into your incision, which is really, really cool. I love that. I feel like one of the things that happens when we become moms is we may not be able to shower as often, yes. making it feel like we're not ourselves anymore. So hello, uh, shower wipe. So you don't need oh. to get in or out of, out of bed, right? Just watch the pee. Exactly, right? exactly. Whatever yeah. you need to do. Uh, scar patches, really important, right? Okay. So these are really neat because they're waterproof, they're hydrating, they're reusable, they take care of the soreness and the redness that accompany yeah. C-sections. Okay, so you might have the scar down here exactly. and you put this on and it basically, it covers it up so nothing's gonna touch it. Exactly. And then and does some healing work. Heal it. it, right. Beautiful. Yes. And also the abdominal binder. And don't uh, mistake this for the waist trimmer because that's not what we're doing here right. this is actually going to provide if you want to hold it up here support yep. for the, uh, the stomach area because yeah. they've had to cut through muscle they've had to cut through the uterus mm. it's going to be hard to move yep. this is going to help compress add a little bit of pressure so you don't feel the pain as much um, and this is just a few of the amazing things oh. that are in this kit and you I can buy them I the like... wrong way around but I remember the feeling of just wanting something tight around my abs there you go Frida. like just to feel like you're like you've got it all together I can't do it now but <laughs> there you go yeah Frida your best there we friend go. oh I've got it backwards or something that's but... okay oh it's a nice look right I like it it keeps all your guts together very and nice you don't feel like you're gonna spill out that's right um, and then you also have a vaginal recovery kit okay um, that looks like this and it's kind of cute like the kits are actually really really neat they're right pretty. they're pretty they yeah. make you feel neat and trendy but they also work really well and so some of the items you can actually buy separately or together First, let me introduce to you the Perry Bottle. 
The okay. parity bottle. Yes. So what are we doing with this guy? So after you have birth, whichever way it happens, yep. there's going to be trauma, right? And so, but you need to keep these areas clean, especially when you're going to the bathroom. Yes. I didn't want anything touching there. No toilet paper, no hands. Like that was not happening. Yeah. This is what I get sent home with from the hospital. Oh, I okay. remember that. Yes. Yes. So this is supposed to. You're supposed to be able to splash some water up there. Yes, exactly. Um, it's not the easiest thing to do, <laughs> right. especially when you're not feeling like yourself. Yes. And this is. Oh, and look so at this. this is, Okay, yes. you get it? Do you get it? A little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of the... It does it. it does. All right. No, but you literally want it clean. You want it clean. But you don't want paper. Exactly. You don't and want any toilet paper. No infection. You yeah. also, it, it hurts to pee there yeah. when you have tearing. Yeah. This is so refreshing. And whenever I pee, I'm like, give me the peri bottle. Give me the peri bottle. I'm not peeing until I have the peri bottle, yes. right? Because it yes. makes such a huge difference. Fantastic. Um, yeah, and it just helps soothe that area. Also, you get vaginal, you get underwear for vaginal births. Yes. You can see that it's not a high waist, but it has more coverage here because yes. you bleed more. Yeah. Right? Beautiful. Um, and and on top of that, yeah. check this out. Cooling pads that you line oh, your underwear with, yes. which is really, really neat. This is really, like, if, I wish I had this when I had the babies because you do just want to sit on something cool. And, and yes. an ice pack is almost too cold and too hard. And you have to do it yourself. And you have to do it yourself. So this is nice and soft. Yes. Oh, my gosh, I love that. And the catch-all pads, oh Tracy. My God. The bigger, the better. They're so great. <laughs> yes. You live for these. And what's great about them is that they're bigger, so they catch it all because yeah. there's more than just blood. This material absorbs a lot of the different substances that come out mm -hmm. as well, and it's comfortable, more comfortable than like the plastic. Yes, my mama to be sitting in the front row, don't be scared. <laughs> no. I promise you, but at the hospital, they're, they're gonna give you like two of these and I looked at them like, <laughs> what am I gonna need those for? <laughs> I needed a box. All okay? of them, all of them. Uh, you want all of them. So I love that women can go out and find these themselves. I've got great news as well. One lucky audience member is gonna go home with all of these Freedom Mom Recovery yeah. Essentials. Is going home with the Frida Mom Snot Sucker to help make life with baby a little easier. Plus, all of you watching at home have the chance to win a $100 Babies R Us gift card. Just visit cityline.tv to enter. Uh, we want you to win those as well. Yes. Let's talk about the nipples. Yes. So, these you can actually all get at Bought Babies R Us individually or together. Just an FYI. Good to know. Okay. Nipples. We talked about nipple care, how important it is. We know about nipple butters, yes. but what else can we do, right? So, for example, you have hot and cold breast therapy packs. Okay. I got these from Amazon. You yeah. can warm them up, you can uh, cool them down just to really alleviate the pain yeah. around the breast that you feel during engorgement. Yeah. And honestly, Amazon was the best purchase we made, Prime. You get everything delivered to your bed, oh, right? Amazing. <laughs> Which exactly. Really nice. You also have these. I wish I had these. They're stainless steel nipple covers. Yeah. And it's the silver really healing. It has a lot of great properties. It looks weird, but you don't want anything touching your nipple. Absolutely. When, when you have, when you're nursing. So it's like, you can put this on underneath your bra. Exactly. If you're and even wearing a bra, like, <laughs> exactly. don't feel like you gotta, right? I definitely didn't. And you know what I use, Trace? Good old cabbage. This is what got me through the engorgement, through yes. the bloody nipples. It's easy. It's fast. Yeah. Um, you just peel them off. You're like Ariel, you know? <laughs> <laughs> if you want any or all of these items, you want to add them to your cart, make sure to grab your phone. You can scan the QR code. We throw that up on the screen a few times, and you can just shop the show. It'll lead you right to these products. Shobana, thank you. We'll be right back. Stay with us, everyone. <laughs> nice. Coming up, incontinence. What is it and how you can handle it? We've talked about Kegels, you know, doing it. I was just doing it right Me now. Too. You, can, you can tell in my face. Welcome back. The body changes so much after having a baby. Many women suffer with incontinence. What is it and why does it happen? Dr. Marjorie Dixon is here to explain. <laughs> Thank you for talking uh, to us about this. What is incontinence? It's the involuntary loss of urine. Mm -hmm. So you're not controlling it, and then you pee. And then you pee. And there are a variety of types of incontinence. Okay. There's the one that, you know, you're with your kids bouncing on a trampoline, and then it's like, oh. Trickles? Yeah, the, the comes with exercise or yeah. with the lifting heavy things. So that's called stress, when you're doing something, and then you have a little bit of urine loss. Yeah. And then there's the other type that's called urge incontinence. Mm -hmm. Urge is when all of a sudden you have the urgency. You wake up in the middle of the night, and you're like, 
got to pee. And I have it's, to go now. I have to go now. Too bad the toilet's not right here. Yeah. Or you see your front door when you're coming from your oh, car. You pull into the driveway, like, oh god, I got to pee all of a sudden. That's urge yes. incontinence. Sometimes there are mixed types. Yeah. Um, and there's also overflow incontinence. So that's where your bladder it doesn't empty regularly and it overfills because there's an obstruction. That's more common in men. Oh, okay. okay. I have the urge one. I have none of them. Yeah, well, why are you bragging right I'm now? I'm not bragging. <laughs> I just, for the, my babies flew out, right? And so it's just my pelvic floor. We didn't need floor. you to add to the conversation in that way. Well, you know, but, but if I laugh really hard, I might. So that's some stress. So that's stress, urinary incontinence. When you have a big belly laugh and whoop. Oh, there yeah. it is. Why, why does it happen after having a baby? Well, you, your pelvic floor yeah. is, is muscle, right? Right. And when you get pregnant and your uterus grows, your intra-abdominal contents add pressure to your pelvic floor. It has to support all of that stuff. Right. Um, and then also the hormones of pregnancy can loosen up that. Yeah. But imagine then you push a baby out, especially when you have a large baby. Mm -hmm. and you push it through the muscle of the pelvic floor. They're made to accommodate and do that, but it adds strain and stress. It stretches it all out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there can be some nerve damage when you deliver a very large baby or just have a delivery of a baby that's large for you. Yeah. Um, and the suspensory ligaments that suspend the bladder, that hold the bladder in place, sort of let loose too. And so that's why after having a baby, it's more common. How common is it? Very common. Actually, okay. incontinence... You know, they range, they'll say it's from 25% of women up to 50% of women. Then after the age of 65, 75% of women. Oh, so most of us. It's, yeah, most of us eventually. Yeah, It's eventually. not quite death and taxes, but... The, right. You're right. But incontinence is very common. And it's a little less stigmatized, I think, than it used to be. Like, you see ads for urinary oh incontinence stuff on TV all the time. I buy leak-proof uh, panties from NYX now. Yeah. Like, every, like I can buy leak-proof thongs. So, obviously, it's a lot more spoken it's, about It is these very days. prevalent. And, actually, there's one of the number one reasons people actually go into nursing home in their older age. Oh, because, because of the Because of the continence issues. It just can no longer be managed. So it's important to understand what's happening and then yeah. what you can do about it. What, what's the big deal about having a leaky bladder? Like, are there, but does risks this lead for to bad it, so, things? So, well, it can lead to bad things. Leaking bladder, urine is never fun. Okay. Um, but and, and some people find it embarrassing. It affects your daily life, your quality of daily living. Imagine thinking about, some people map out bathrooms where they are oh, because totally. they're like, I, I need to know where the bathroom is because I gotta go. Um, but if you're heavier, obesity is one of the risks. If you're a smoker, that's a risk of it. If you've had a baby, multiple vaginal deliveries. If you had a large baby, if you had an episiotomy, um, if you had a tear, you talked about first, second, third degree, fourth degree tears, if you mm -hmm. had those in delivery. That's one of the risk factors. What do you do about it? Yeah, how do we We've done it? it before. We've talked about Kegels. You know, you have your um, elevator on the basement floor. You lift it up, up, up. You squeeze, you squeeze, and, and then you let it down Are you again. Doing it? I was just doing it right Me now. Too. You, can, you can tell in my face. So mm -hmm. th that's tried, tested, true. There are pessaries. Sometimes you to change the angle of the urethra. You put pessaries, vaginal pessaries work. There can be physiotherapy, uh, bladder training, habits changing, mm. not drinking caffeine, not drinking right before you go to bed, stop drinking at 7 o'clock. Yeah. There are a lot of ways that you can train. It's usually a combination of those things, and if those fail, yeah, surgery. Okay. I'm going to go get a personal trainer for my bladder. You don't need one. <laughs> I know. Just I know. squeeze. It's good information, Doc. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. We all know that it's essential for women to keep their pelvic floor healthy and to keep strengthening them on a regular basis, especially after pregnancy and childbirth. Well... What if I told you there was a whole new non-invasive and dignified way to do this? We sent Vivian Kay to experience a Kegel throne, a Euro spot, firsthand. Take a look. When I say Kegels, you're doing it. You're doing it, right? I I'm doing it right now. Well, I'm about to do 11,000 Kegels in 28 minutes. I know, unbelievable. Well, let me show you how. You're doing great. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I didn't just jump into it. It was a process. This is our consultation room. You can just take a seat on the couch. First, we started with a consultation where I was asked all kinds of questions about my peeing habits by the lovely Erin. Does this sound like you? You come home with your groceries and you just have overpowering urgency. It's like, I can't do anything till I find that bathroom. Like I call it the Bluetooth connecting. <laughs> So it's like my bladder knows, you're home. It's connected to yeah. the toilet Bluetooth, and then I gotta go. So that's a trigger for you. 
when you have that overpowering urgency, do you ever leak on the way to the washroom? Or as uh, you're like, uh, trying to get I the have, pants off? I have. Okay. I have. Does this sound like you go to the washroom, think you're done, stand up? Oh, no, not quite done. Yep. Okay. Sit back down, make sure I'm yeah. at a different angle. <laughs> make sure I can get it all out. Yeah. After a lesson on the pelvic floor musculature, it was time to sit on the much awaited Kegel throne. Ta da! <laughs> <laughs> Step one done. Okay. Let's lift your sweater up so your sweater's not oh, underneath yeah, yeah. you. Don't yeah. put any barriers. You got it. And you're going to um, spread your legs a little bit. Yeah. Okay. And next we're going to do a little lift and spread of our bum. So we want to get, uh, I'm trademarking lift and spread. We want to get our bum out of the way so that we can get our perineum down on the chair. And then just rest your hands moving on your knees. That's fine. Slide. Oh yeah, it's, it, it's, it's doing that, that's what it's doing. It feels like a jolt of electricity just going up your hoo-hoo. <laughs> and Vivian K joins us in studio, and Aaron as well. Okay, Viv, the reason you started this whole thing is you were you were peeing a lot at night. Yeah, so after I had my son, I was peeing, getting up and peeing once and twice a night. After I had my hysterectomy, it got worse. And I need to yeah. sleep, right? Yes. I was also depending on leak-proof underwear, especially when I'm traveling. And, you know, I was I was avoiding drinking water. You know I love to drink water and mind my business. I couldn't drink the water <laughs> because I was too busy. I, w I didn't want to pee as much, yes. right? So... This. <laughs> so this. We all want to know, like, uh, did it work for you? Yes. Yes. So before, I used to pee two to three times a night. Now I sleep through the night. <gasps> I used to be able to just pick up a blueberry. Yeah. Now I'm picking up kiwis. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, I love that you tried it out. I'm going to try it out now. So we brought yes. Aaron in because I'm going to try it. Yes. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but tell me what to do. Okay, I want you to sit in the middle of the chair. Okay. Move back. Move back a little <laughs> bit more. Uh huh. Tee hee hee. Move back a little tiny bit oh, more. Oh, okay. yeah. How okay. Does it feel? Oh, okay. How does it feel? Well, it's not like I just didn't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. So, it, oh, it's like, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's. Stimulating your pelvic floor muscles. That. Mm -hmm. And so what's oh. happening is it's strengthening the muscle that's been damaged for whatever reason. Yeah. And at the same time, it's creating a neuromuscular connection, kind of a reboot between your brain, your bladder, and your pelvic floor. My so that face those is things like this because I don't know what to do about mm -hmm. this feeling. It's not terrible. It's not, it's a bad not feeling. bad, no. but it's almost like it's, it's 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 being vigorously massaged. So you feel it. Um, is this covered by OHIP, by the way, for so, those of us in in this province in Ontario? Not by OHIP, but partially covered by your benefits. Um, so physiotherapy benefits. We just try and get it oh, right. That's oh, that's really that's that's the spot. That's the spot. Yeah. Okay. So how long would you? So how many sessions would you do? We'd see you six times. So twice a week over three weeks. Uh huh. And then on top of that, we're going to do everything Dr. Dixon said. We're going to talk about your lifestyle, your behavior, your uh, you know what you're consuming to also try and make those changes too. I Aaron, did thank you times. so much for this. I Viv, you liked it too times. much. It's time for a short break. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back, everyone. Stay with us. for sharing all of their experiences. A huge thank you to everyone watching at home and all of you in studio. It's been lovely hanging out with you today. Just a beautiful audience. You know, I hope you learned something today. Uh, we're gonna make sure that this conversation keeps going. We'll see you back here tomorrow for Home Day.